So I guess I'm out of the book club. Howdy, everyone. Welcome to Unsafe Space. Uh, I'm a guy you haven't seen in a while because I haven't streamed in a while. My name is Carter Laren. You're watching uh, the Unsafe Space Book Club. Today is Sunday, February 12th. I hear there's some kind of sports balling game going on today, but we know where your priorities lie. So uh, appreciate you being here. Um, like I said, I haven't been around for a while. Uh, that's not the subject of this uh, <laughs> show today. We're here to talk about a book called Light by M. John Harrison. And uh, feel free to jump in in chat in YouTube or Rumble, or if you're watching later on, just comment. And um, I think that's it. Oh, the next book. Uh, I'm going to actually pull up the next book so I can, before I say what it is, I should know what it is. The next book is um, hmm, Thomas T St. Thomas is doing the next book, and I forget the name of it, but let me look it up. It is... The Weirdest People in the World. It's a nonfiction book by Joseph Henrik. Um, so if you want that, you can go to unsafespace.com. There's a book club link. You can see it there. Uh, it's kind of an interesting um, sociology slash psychology book. Uh, it's called How the West, The Weirdest People in the World, How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous and Apparently Quite Alliterative. So... Um, Anyway, today, running book club is uh, Matt, who is a longtime contributor, listener, been around on Safe Space for a while. He's the one who chose this book, Light. So I'm going to let him take over from here and tell you what's so awesome and uh, and kick off the discussion. So, Matt, welcome. Hey, thanks, Carter. Um, hello, everybody. Um, this is my introduction to uh, Light, why we should be reading it, etc. So, um Written by M. John Harrison. Um, he was born 1945, um, still right into this day. He's uh, 77 years old. Um, got his first break writing um, in Science Fantasy magazine back in 1966, which brought him to the attention of Michael Moorcock. Um, if you guys are really into your sci-fi, you'll probably know him as um, a science fiction and fantasy writer. Um, he's had a big sway in the... Um, British sci-fi and fantasy um, area. On the basis of his uh, first book, it got him uh, a job with uh, New Worlds um, editing um, with Michael Moorcock. So he moved uh, down into London and started his literary career. Uh, two years later, he moved over as literary editor of New Worlds, another science fiction and uh, fantasy related publication. And he was a proponent of the um, new wave scientific uh, fiction uh, movement that was uh, around the 60s and 70s, aiming to um, take science fiction from something that was suitable only for small boys and uh, the mentally challenged and um, drag it out of the genre backwaters into um, some kind of literary respectability. Um, the kind of new wave um, proponents would be himself, uh, Alfred Bester, Michael Moorcock, uh, uh, J.G. Bath. Um, symptomatic of the style of these authors would be um, a kind of dark, bleak, apocalyptic future, um, bringing forth a lot of the um, shiny, chromium uh, features of the 50s and uh, adding a little bit of tarnish and uh, the end of the world usually, particularly with uh, people like Ballard, as you probably would know from um, his um, movie versions of his uh, books. Uh, 1974, um, he wrote his third novel, The Centauri Device, um, which was now lauded as his only book in the science fiction Masterworks series, uh, which is well worth checking out if you uh, want to... Um, an intro into some of the best sci-fi that's been written in the last uh, 50 to 100 years. Described as uh, space opera, it was um, very much a reaction to a lot of the um, sci-fi that was around at the time. Um, 
he wanted to turn things on his head and um, show um, some of the daft things in sci-fi while um, giving him, giving a vision of um, space opera that wasn't just thrusting heroes and um, as he referred to it in one interview, a, a colonial future. Um, doing research for this, I found uh, he'd written a few books under pseudonyms, um, 1989, a novel called Climbers, and 1987, a, a ghost-written um, biography of the famous British climber Ron Fawcett. Um, a little more to say about that a little bit later. Um, he came to my notice with light, um, a book I found merely because of colour of the uh, cover, which is not how you're supposed to choose books, but it got me to pick it up and read uh, the blurb and thought this sounds interesting. Back in 2000, 2005 sort of era, um, it won the uh, James Tiptree Jr. Award and uh, became the first in a trilogy. Uh, known as the Kefahuchi Trapped uh, Trilogy. The second one, Nova Swing, came out in 2006. It won the Arthur C. Clarke Award in 2007 and the Philip K. Dick Award in 2008. And the final book in the trilogy, Empty Space, um, was published in 2012. Um, I'm much more interested in the... Um, stories rather than the artists that write them they're interesting in and of themselves but i think um i think fiction should, or art should stand on it, its own uh, own two feet so uh let's leave a, a very short history of m john harrison side and move on to uh, the book itself um in summary of light it's a tripartite tale uh, following the um fortunes of three characters Seria, Genla Kamau, Michael Kearney, and Ed Chianis. Um, Seria um, is a spaceship. Well, she was a small girl until she had her bones broken and wires put into her. And she was wired into a, a new style of technology that took alien tech and biomodification to create, um, actually, the next best weapon. Um, depending on who you speak to, either the mathematics or Seria herself, stole her ship herself, the white cat, um, which happens before the start of the novel and is a part of the narrative arc for this. Then uh, the novel opens with Michael Kearney set in our time. Uh, he is a physicist and mathematician working with Brian Tate. Um, he is um, on the cutting edge of quantum mechanics um so back in 2003 this came out uh, back in 2003 it was the the next big thing everyone had a Mon mandelbrot set on the wall and um people were starting to see some of the um promises of quantum mechanics um, and uses um brought to light um, it's a significant theme of light in the novel is um the weirdness of the universe expressed by um, quantum theory, but also um, other narrative elements drawn together uh, um, as he progresses. And the final uh, main character is Ed Chinese, a drug-addled uh, chaser of adventure, um, who we find from the beginning um, as a, a twink, someone who um, spends their time plugged into a artificial reality um, environment in a tank full of goo and um, wasters and um, the lost usually. So the three characters um, are the, the bedrock um, each gets their own um, chapters as it progresses through the novel. Um, they are the leads on everything and um, they seem initially separate and uh, incredibly different so uh, Michael Kearney is in our time um, in the early 2000s. Ed and Syria are in the 24th century uh, after mankind has made its way out into the um, 
galaxy uh, to throw its weight around and start blowing things up and uh, stealing alien technology and the like. The novel um, is described um, as a space opera, which I think is a um, pretty poor rendition of the style of uh, book because it doesn't carry a lot of the um, traditional themes of space opera. There's no um, thrusting main lead. There's uh, no epic space battles. Um, everything in light, whether it's in current times or uh, in the far future, is dirty and um, overused or stolen or broken. It's a uh, um, not a pristine future or not a pristine present that we see. The set setting and style is the first thing that interested me with light. Um, it opens up following uh, Michael Kearney being asked what he would do at the uh, turn of the millennium um, before he murders his um, lady interest on his way off from the party. Um, a jarring strange introduction to a sci-fi um, novel which doesn't get any um, less weird as it progresses. Um, as each character is introduced we get a very different feel of the universe and um, Ed the twink is introduced um, in his artificial reality world um, which is just set as a um, pseudo-noir uh, adventure where he is the uh, private dick lead um, anyone that's read Pulp Fiction will um, recognise that as um, a thematic origin um, and he is presented just as a, a desperate loser and um, Seria is introduced um, as a very powerful and um, mysterious character who stole herself as a spaceship um, and is currently floating out and about in the galaxy causing mayhem and behaving in very, very odd and bizarre um, ways. <clears throat> so a lot of science fiction that works mm -hmm. well takes elements of our current world and um, casts them into the future. Um, give them one level of a move to allow a bit of reflection um, from ourselves at this time. And some of the things that uh, struck me most um, were the neo-slavery, child abuse, corporatism and transhumanism, elements that we'd recognise from ourselves today, but um, explored better when you can see them in a um, far future time. Um, I suggested before um, The Climbers, his 1989 book, um, would have some relevance. This is uh, not a book I was aware of, as it was written pseudonymously. Um, but it's evident that he's a very uh, keen climber, or was in his uh, earlier life anyway. Um, and I think that really shines out um, on reflection. Uh, being a climber myself, um, you come to recognise some of the um, behaviours of those who do stupid things for fun and so the um the entradista um who is the guy flying the ship made of mathematics and uh, foam through the surface layers of a sun or um, any of the other mad crazy adventures that we hear relayed initially um by ed Sheenies and then about ed Sheenies is definitely a reflection on um the motivations and behaviours of those people that do really daft things for hobbies. Um, back to the themes and um, styles of the novel, um, it seems to flip uh, quantum states between a psychedelic fever dream and a dark, bleak narrative that's never quite resolved. Um, another way it differs from space opera it doesn't do the um, info dumps that a lot of them do where they break out from the narrative to explain 
um, some necessary MacGuffin to um, push the narrative along or make things um, comprehensible to the reader. Um, the style um, Harrison uses is just to drop breadcrumb hints um, that don't explain, but um, just place imagery in the mind that allows you to make your own connections. Um, you know, it kicks off talking about the Kepahuchi tract, which is just a singularity without um, without borders. Uh, K ships not described. Shadow operators, you understand that they're an important element to the um, novel as they um, are related to many of the events, particularly with Seria, um, but they're not explained. And the cultivars, strange, weird creatures with um, tusks and uh, horns and bizarre behaviours. The import and understanding um, comes out through the um, story without being mostly explicit, um, using dark poetry and um, context to make it clear what's occurring. Though, so, on about my ninth three read, read this many times it became um more clear to me that there were a second um triple in the novel that of the shranda the mathematics and madame shen the three bizarre um ghosts stalking the narrative so the shranda is a horrific malevolent presence chasing michael kearney um, to begin with, you're not sure if he's just batshit crazy or if there is indeed something stalking him. Madame Shen, who doesn't appear until later on in the uh, narrative, but who is just described as a, an oriental woman who isn't a woman, shifting in age, but who controls Ed from the moment um, he is aware of it and then backwards in time. And then you have the mathematics, um, baffling, otherworldly, um, part of a K-ship, part of the way that um, computers are explained in the, in the far future, but with a personality. Um, as the narrative develops, obviously it becomes apparent that they are one and the same. Um, and weaving to the conclusion of the um, book, it feels weird um, talking about the end of a book. No spoilers, but there you go. Um, being bleak all where it finally resolves. Interested to find out what everyone's going to think about this one. Um, why Why did I want to advocate for it? Um, it's one of my favourite books. Um, I've read it um, many, many times. It's one I... Uh, look up every once in a while um, because I think it is um, a perfect piece of science fiction. Um, 20 years on, it hasn't aged badly. A lot of science fiction ages really badly because it, it tries to predict things or um, gets things so wrong um, that they become clunky and uh, out of date um, too, too soon. Um, and I think it's got an incredible relevance. Um, we are much further along with our search for quantum computers, but we're not there. But the magic and mystery that underpins the quantum world is being revealed more and more um, as we still long for the stable key bits, which haven't yet arrived. Um, and I think it's uh, cultural relevance. Um, yeah, stands out today. Um, the cultivars just um, were an interesting device when I read it 20 years ago, but looking at them now, I just see um, the transhumanist um, approach that the body is just something that can be changed, modified, added to, um, swapped out for a better version. Um, something that in my mind underpins like the trans ideology and the um, queer theory, which brings it to a relevance to us today um the expansionism and colonialism um i don't mean 
feeling guilty about past uh, colonialism, thinking about the way that um, every time humanity finds a new um, border or boundary, there's always someone out there waving a flag, trying to um, take hold of it and snatch it for themselves. Um, the ever-present war. It's uh, a theme that bubbles beneath the surface of the um, novel from beginning to end. That and the search for profit, like Earth military contracts, is uh, the military of the future. But it's essentially just another corporate body. And then ultimately, it's the search for meaning. Not that you can ever find that, but um, the search is always worth um, worth the quest. And in the end, the Shrand of the Mathematics and Madame Shen mm. um, drops the denouement that we as humans are nothing more than an experiment in the hope to be able to achieve where they once failed. So uh, I think that's probably enough just of me chatting away. So um, bring everyone back in now and uh, maybe start the discussion. Cool. Thanks, man. Uh... Well, I'm not in charge, but it seems like uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what Alex thought of it, and I can say what I thought of it. So, Alex, why don't you? Yeah, I mean, that would be my uh, first thing would be what people thought. I found this book so weird. Like, I didn't, uh, and I read it twice, by the way. And um, I think the thing that stood out to me the most is how sexually weird it is <laughs> is the, like i just kept noticing that like there's a point where someone is ma casually masturbating in the same room as her brother's corpse it's so and i was like is everyone like sexually dysfunctional in this entire book and then you have the character who can't have sex um you know because she's a ship but like it was that's the thing that stood out to me the most about the entire book and i i'm not i don't really know that i can say whether or not i liked it or disliked it because it was just so weird that i couldn't like grab it like no no matter how like i read it twice and i still could not like just get into it unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of sexual dysfunction. Uh, <laughs> well, which it was, was no weird. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I have a question. This book made me think of a question. I have, I have a question for you guys. Cool. What's the difference between science fiction and fantasy or like magic novels? Well, um, if you go for the um, standard definition, um, science fiction should be possible. Um, all of the MacGuffins and the things that aren't possible now are provided by mastery of technology, um, human, alien, whatever. Whereas fantasy um, requires uh, nothing more than magic. Um, so, yeah. The, re the reason I'm feel. asking... It, well, the, the reason I'm asking this is because um, the I, d I almost don't know what to think of this book also, Alex. So I'm kind of in <laughs> Alex's camp and like I'm not sure what to think about it. Um, but the one of the things that struck me that was that was tough for me was I kept having the um, I repeatedly had the the uh, fourth wall torn down or like the the I, i'm supposed to be able to spend suspend disbelief and but when um when a science fiction author makes really egregious obvious scientific errors it 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 undermines my ability to trust like i know star trek's not real right so like i'm not i'm not saying i believe in dilithium crystals and i like i watch star trek and i'm like oh yes that's that's what must be happening but if they started to say things that made no sense, like on a level that I understood, I would, it takes me out of the story because I'm like, well, this guy's just making shit up. Right. Um, and I felt like he did not do a lick of scientific research. Um, like even simple stuff, like referring to degrees, Kelvin, like 
that's not the scale. It's just Kelvin. Like there's like no, there's no, there's no effort made to make it scientifically accurate. And I contrast it to a book like um, three body problem, which is also fantastical and crazy shit going on and stuff that can't possibly happen in nth dimensions and all this weird crap. But at no point, and I'm a layman, I'm not a physicist at no point am I reading three body problem going, well, that's wrong. I'm reading it going, well, I, I don't know. I mean, everything I know is right. And beyond that, it's like, I don't know. Right. But this, I, I, I'm reading it and I'm like, well, this just doesn't, it's just techno babble. He's just throwing together physics words and like hoping that something pops out at the other end. And he's using it to cover over magic, basically. Um, and that that bothered me. Um, however, so two things about I'll tell you the two things that bothered me and then I'll have the big butt at the end of it. So that bothered me. And the other thing that bothered me was the characters were not responsible for their own destiny, really. Um, like there's just a. Stuff just happens to people, and I can't stand that generally. Like, uh, let's take Kearney. So he's a murdering guy. Like, he's an evil, evil guy. He's a murderer. And he didn't have to be a murderer. <laughs> okay. So I guess he decided to make himself a murderer. But, like, at the end, the question is, like, why is this thing stalking him? And, like, the answer was, I just like the something about you. I'm like, that was horribly unsatisfying. Like, why was Michael Kearney chosen? The answer is, eh, something about Michael Kearney. She kind of liked him. Or she, she found him kind of interesting. I'm like, well, that was really, that was a big letdown. Um, Saria Moore, like, the whole, like, finding out that, that she's kind of been manipulated the whole time. I kind of feel like no one has any, it's not character driven at all. There's no, there's no like, typically with a plot, like I look for a character makes decisions and those decisions have consequences, but it turns out like everyone was just manipulated uh, basically. Um, and there's very few, there's very little relevant decision-making that happens. So those are the two big problems I had with it. The flip side is it's extremely creative and I did find myself getting into the, like, I got to the end of it and I was like, well, now what happens? <laughs> like, I'm like, all right, so well, that's a good sign. Cause I'm like, I did actually download the audio book for the next book because I'm kind of like, well, I kind of want to know what happens. So for some reason, so all that said about the characters and the mat and the physics, I still some for some reason I still kind of care that I care to know what's going on. I'm curious enough. He's built a world that I'm curious enough to know what the hell happens next, even though 50% of it doesn't make any sense, maybe more, it doesn't make any sense at all. I'm still like, what's what's happening next? Like now, now what happens? Um so and, and the world is is interesting. And I'm wondering if I need to read it again because did you read the intro to this version of this book? No, mine was uh, 20 odd years. All right, I'm going to read this intro. It's a fascinating, like not the whole thing, just the first paragraph. Yeah. It's by Adam Roberts. When I first read Light, I disliked it very much. It seems to me a deliberately unpleasant book. It's world building erratic and it's plot garbled. A novel that handled its frequent interludes of demeaning violence in a defatiguingly offhand way. That's a that's a hell of a way to start an intro, right? Not every piece of writing hits home for every reader, and that's fine. I moved on to other novels. But, it transpired, light would not leave me alone. It kept popping back into my thoughts, images, and moments from its re recurring to me with strange intensity. I, It dawned on me I was going to have to reread the book. I think it's a typo. It says, I dawned on me. I think it means it dawned on me that I was going to have to reread the book. On a second reading, light revealed itself to me as, quite simply, a masterpiece, an extraordinarily, an extraordinary combination of space opera thrills, textual and atmospheric richness, and a sublime opacity that hovers on the very lip of profound insight. I have read a lot of books in my life, and sometimes I think a little better or a little worse of a novel when I reread it. But the volt face I experienced rereading light remains for me unique in my reading life. So maybe I'm not the only one who was like, what the fuck? Uh, but we'll come back. Maybe I need to reread it and we'll come back to it. Um, I just, 
I guess so I would like to understand. I've uh, read this one. How does all like, that sit with you? Um, I've lost it. Um, interesting, interesting, and I can't say that I can't see where you're coming from with it. Um, the thing um, with regards to the technology, um, it's the idea that he doesn't make a whole song and dance of it, but it is just kind of like casually dropped in there. That um, when you come from different um, technologies or different races or different alien species and whatever, um, we discover that everything works. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as you've got a story for it, it will work, whether it's, you know, um, K technology or Alcubia drives or anything. Um, some weird aliens in uh, safes spinning around your um, main ship. And I think that didn't... Um, I mean, I hear what you say, like, uh, Degrees Kelvin is, is just a basic error, but that didn't shock me out. It was more um, the sense that any bit of technology could be described and it is meant not just to be like, ooh, but it is meant to have a level of physics underpinning it, but holy shit, it all works. Everything works. Um, and it seems almost like the Kefahuchi tract um, was this weird thing that just hovers in the sky in front of uh, civilizations, driving them absolutely mental because they can't get a handle on it but it forces them to develop their own technology, their own culture, even extinguish their own, own culture. So I didn't find that was um, knocking me out of the narrative at all. With regards to the characterizations, um, on reflection, it's like they are all detestable characters. Every single yes. one of them is a murderer <laughs> yes. and a thief and a broken damaged human but i found i i found um echoes that i could recognize in myself of some of their behaviors in a sure. in a disquieting manner and that's something i do like um in fiction where you know you don't have to like the characters but you can see a relevance in them and looking at something so broken and going oh yeah i, I see a reflection there that's not a yeah they were relatable yeah even though they were evil they were re like they were relatable you could get like okay and you find yourself even i mean at points i found myself caring about i'm like oh no what's gonna happen to carney and then i'm like wait a minute he's a fucking serial killer why do i care <laughs> like or even saria Moore, where it's like it opens with her murderous behavior and I'm like oh I actually shouldn't like she's kind of detestable also I, you're bringing up though you're bringing up the reason why i asked the difference between like fantasy and science fiction because i look at this if we say this isn't a science fiction book and it's more like fantasy or like even neo-religious it be, because because there's this ultimate like well like you said all of the physics maybe we should explain that more for people who haven't read it but like you, you, there's a there's a point in the book where they explain all these different alien cultures built their entire physics based on different assumptions about the world and it turned out even if the assumptions contradicted each other uh between one culture and another all of them worked so long as the like so long as they stayed with their narrative about their assumptions their their technology worked and that kind of undermines the science part of science fiction completely and makes this like there's something else going on here that's what we would traditionally call unscientific that underpins all of this and i don't know where the other two books go but i almost i almost feel like this could potentially go into something almost spiritual that's like there is something that i might classify as magic behind this or does that make sense Very much so, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said, um... sorry, Alex, go on. I guess there's a delay. I, I was having four download speed, by the way. Um, but I was going to say that I see a thematic difference between sci-fi and fantasy that a lot of people don't. Um, and that being that sci-fi is about how 
new technologies affect human behavior and our understanding of philosophy, whereas fantasy tends to be about the resilience of um, like a core of humanity and pitted against odds that are insanely high. Um, so the, I see those huge differences between sci-fi and fantasy in th theme, not just the world building aspect, which is what most people talk about. And this one does not have fa the fa fantasy theme or the sci-fi theme. I would argue that it has more of a noir theme, as in the dirty side, which is noir is uh, actually built on the gothic understanding of theme as well, which is about the, the dirty uh, aspects of humanity, the parts of ourselves that we're not very proud of uh, coming out and trying to find a balance between civilization and the, the less uh, savory parts of our psyches. So I would say that this falls more under that thematically than it does anything sci-fi or fantasy, which is why it's so hard to place um, and why I don't really consider it a sci-fi book or a fantasy book or a space opera, none of those things. Uh, I, I, and even, I think to some extent, Harrison knows that because when we are partially introduced to Ed Chinese, he is like in a tank pretending to be a noir detective. So it's almost as if he knows that. And the, the sisters who are constantly going after him are also very uh, embl emblematic of a noir novel, not a, uh, and, and also the, the way he meets um, Annie, the uh, rickshaw girl, and immediately just starts having sex with her. That is very, very much in the noir style of novel writing. So that's why I see this, and, and maybe it's three pronged story is part of the reason why it's really hard to place. But even, I would say even Carney is more from the thriller genre, what with him being a serial killer and us following him, which is also another offshoot of noir itself. So like, I feel like it's, it's such a strange novel and and i think there's stuff to it that we could like really that it really is doing things it's just it's so hard to place and uh and but i i do think that he undervalues real science in this book and it kind of does bother me and it feels and the prose style is more noirish too, only like the way he plays with language and everything. So that's why, I, I mean, there's a lot here that I would argue that makes this a, just a really weird noir novel, honestly. What about like cyberpunk as a genre? I think because I haven't read a lot of cyberpunk. Like prose style is a lot like... <laughs> yeah, there is a delay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm on the wrong continent. <laughs> so cyberpunk um, is dated already. Um, I mean, you did Neuromancer not that long ago, and um, looking back at that, it's like, oh, my God. Um, so many of the predictions just seem so laughable about the technology. That it, there was so much specificity thrown in there. Um I mean, yeah, it does still carry the dark, dirty, noir elements. Um, there is that similarity there, but it's too hard sci-fi. Um, I think um, Mr. Harrison would be pretty impressed that you didn't like the novel as a sci-fi novel, but liked it as a noir novel. He's always been against the um, total genre pigeonholing of um, sci-fi. And trying to drag it out of that kind of, you know, just laser beams and aliens kind of thing to bring it forward into um, like a much more literary space. Um, and I think he, he, to my mind, he does that really well um, in his dream description. There's a huge amount of dream description that runs all the way through um, every one of the elements, whether it's uh, Kearney's gorse lands or just the uh, pseudo magical happenings or are they magical um, with uh, Valentine's Sprake 
and um, the memory and dreams that um, brother and sister uh, Ed and Saria have that brings out the story of their horrendous um, childhood which drags them forward into the uh, future that you see. Um, yeah, but obviously, you know, that's got a Marmite element to it. You're either going to like the appeal of that or it's going to um, put you off somewhat. The same with the uh, the sex and the violence. I think very, very deliberate uh, using casual and unpleasant sex and violence reference. Um, as a way of showing that we don't necessarily respect um, sex and violence in our own um, society and look where it takes us out into the universe, thrusting our giant space penises around, uh, picking fights with weird aliens. I, I think that's kind of a, a limited view of what sci-fi can do, though, because... If you think about it like this, um, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of sci-fi novels that only introduce like one new element of um, technology, such as like Blake Crouch is a very good example of that. Uh, he does recursion, and in recursion, the the te- the one piece of technology is the ability to go back in time within your own consciousness, and it really asks a lot of questions about determinism and free will there's no aliens in it there is like you know nuclear war and stuff like that in it but it's like it's very specifically focused on this idea of what this does for our understanding of free will so like i i think that sci-fi can do a lot i just think and, and I would call that one more sci-fi novel than this one because it gets down to the nitty gritty of the science of it and, um, and very, very realistic and limited in its scope. But this one, it, it, and its, its prose is also more traditionally sci-fi-ish and it's, it's other plot elements as well. But this just does not capture any anything that i would claim would be sci-fi like even though like he's got space travel in it i don't consider that like specifically a sci-fi element necessarily so it's like it's like aping sci-fi but not really being sci-fi in anything that about the the genre that actually matters which i i find really weird and uh and like I don't know. I feel like he has a completely different understanding of what sci-fi is than I do. Well, I wasn't Matt yeah, saying that. Got... Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. I was, I was going to say he has form um, for this. Like um, the first inclusion in science fiction masterworks that he got was the Centauri device. And that is described as a kind of space opera. Um, and uh, I've got a little quote about it here. Um, I never liked the book that much, but at least it took the piss out of SF's three main tenets. The reader identification character always drives the action. The universe is knowable, and the universe is anthropocentrically anthropocentrically structured and its riches are an appropriate prize for the colonialist people like us. And that was his 74 novel. And so he's always been trying to um, like dismantle um, some of the elements that make it genre and um, push it forward in a new way. And just because um, the classical understanding of um, science fiction is that it can be described um, using science. I don't think it has to be. And, um, if the takeout from the discussion was um, this is struck from the roles of science fiction, but um, is a novel that can be enjoyed, I'd be perfectly happy with that. I'm not. Um, it's it's just a handy placeholder to call it um, sci-fi because it's got spaceships and zooming in it, you know. But um, it the 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 uh, the things that I took out as most important from it are um, as much philosophy or fantasy or um, just existential um, 
thoughts and terror as much as anything else, um, which I enjoyed. I enjoyed I enjoyed the discomfort from the book um, and continue to do so. You know, it's it is weird. It is the fact that there is no what you root for all three characters despite not liking any of them and then in the end find that they were just foils in a, a multi-million year um plot um to have a look at a weirdness a singular singularity without event horizon like what the hell is that you know it's it's just left as a kind of um fill in your own um idea of what the unknowable is and that is what humanity has been um, generated from the chromosomal level up to investigate not not the how of it just the hmm, that sense of wonder which is not a particularly sci-fi um theme or tradition i don't think yeah i mean uh i almost feel like he just uses some of the language for sci-fi to, to tell some kind of uh he doesn't really care about whether it's I, I don't think he would care about it's whether it's sci-fi, right? I, I think he, he he's just using elements because he wants them for the story. Like even the even the statement like singularity without a event horizon is like part of that just like it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. I'm like, what do you talk like it doesn't mean anything. You just strung things together that mean nothing. That's a meaningless thing. I'm like a bagel without a hole. I'm like, then it's not a bagel. Like, what are you talking about? You're just saying things, right? And you're like, it's kind of like when people smoke a lot of pot and they think they said something really profound because they just put contradictions together and they're like, wow, man, think about it. But I don't think he cares. I think he's, because because the, 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 the plus side of this is I didn't put the book down. I was interested in it. It was, it was like, I, it did, it was compelling. Like I wasn't bothered by the violence and sex that Alex <laughs> I mean, it was weird, but I was like, eh, whatever. I, that that's fine. Um, I had no and, problem with the violence at all. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> even the sex I was like, I mean, that one scene that you described, I was, I had to go back and like, wait, was that? Did that just happen? Did she just masturbate in front of her dead brother? Like, is that, is well, that it, just... <laughs> it sticks out to me because I want to know what he means by it. Like, because to me, you wouldn't. <laughs> repeatedly bring this kind of dysfunctional attitude towards sex up unless it had some sort of thematic goal in mind i would hope as opposed to just i like weird sex and i want to put it in my novel i want to know yeah. what he means by it <laughs> well so that's that's the thing that i'm one of the things that maybe keeps me interested in in the novel because like i said i didn't want to put it down i wasn't bored i get bored by bad writing right so i wasn't bored as much as i have complaints about stuff and there were times when i was like ah stop <laughs> like i also wasn't bored which is saying something and i i don't know if part of me is hoping things make sense but there's like i'm worried that it's like the show lost where you're like oh they have a plan and this will make sense and then like after season three or four you're like holy shit they have no fucking idea what they're doing. <laughs> like nothing makes nothing has a meaning. Um, but like Alex, I'm, I'm I'm with you. I'm like, there's a there's a meaning. Like why why is this going on? And I still have enough confidence in him because he is a good writer. That like, yeah, maybe there's a meaning here. Like I I, I and because other people like you know not only Matt who's read it nine times and is and really likes it but just just reading the introduction the guy's like i hated it then i reread it and it's awesome i'm like okay maybe there's some stuff here that i'm i'm not seeing and maybe i need to read the other two and think about it and go back and and whatever because yeah i i asked that question too and and, and why the murdering like what's the point like here's a here's a question because this is one of the things that occurred to me really early on with the Michael Kearney story. So may, maybe I was more frustrated than most by it, but I was like, well, why? I kept waiting to hear what the compelling reason for killing people was. And it never came. And I was like, well, wait, like it's not coming every, and every time we talk, like every time we're in the Kearney story, there's no reason for this. There's no reason for this. The only reason is like, I'm afraid of something. That's not a reason to kill people. So like, I'm, 
And like he had this implication that like killing people keeps it away, but never a why. We never we never hear why he thinks that. And so like we you know we get to the end and it's like oh actually there was no reason this whole time <laughs> like there was no reason to do any of that murder the entire time the thing never wanted him to murder to do that like so now now the question's like well why why is that the character why did we do that why is why was that the, why was it a serial killer why is that the guy we're following why is that the guy like why was he chosen um just the whole thing is just there's so much randomness in it i'm looking for patterns and reasons and my fear in the back of my mind is there is there are none my hope is that there are reasons and like alex will someday give me a call or discord me like i figured out what that scene is and why she's doing that <laughs> okay explain it to me because i don't know i don't i don't know um, we see this thing. I don't know either, and I don't know that I'll ever know. And my worry is that it was just for no reason. And like, I don't have a problem with the idea that Kearney's murdering people and it means nothing. It, it's just a mistake he's made because that's from from a character standpoint, from a writing standpoint, not from like an internal world standpoint. Makes sense, you know, like oh, you 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 were doing this, and there was no reason for you to be doing it, and now you need to feel bad about the fact that you literally had no reason to do it. Like that, from from a from a right. character standpoint, that totally makes sense. That totally has like a meaning, and the meaning yeah. is that don't do horrible things when sure. you don't even know why. <laughs> like, right. But, but the sex part. Do you not think that? Do you not oh, think that that came through though? The the thing about do you, Kearney, do you not think I it think, came? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With he, I mean, it's no, like totally. I you I, can't when she said when you she can't said have like, a, no, I didn't want you to do that. Like I don't know why you were. Like, doing you ruined that. your like, own life. She says. To me. Yeah, yeah. Like that. I I felt like that huh? like worked. You know, because it's like oh Jesus. You know, like now you need to have like this come to you you know this epiphany moment where you think about how you act as a human being that you thought this was a good enough reason. Um, so I feel like that's fine. I have no problem with that. It's, it's, it's the sex part though, is the part where that's a, that's a larger theme about the world that I'm not sure I'm getting. And I'm worried that there is no theme behind it. And that's the part that like, has me like, what the, f like, and you know, I'm not, I'm not like upset by depiction of sex in novels. I feel like people have sex. They should, if you, are going to say that people are having sex, you should probably write it out and show that they are. Um, I don't like it when writers avoid it just because it's, oh, it's not polite to show it. Uh, it bothers me. But m the problem I have with this is that it's dif dysfunctional sex the whole way through. Everyone does it. And I want to know what the writer is trying to say with that because that's one I have not been able to parse out and and i'm not sure i ever will because i've not and i'm like what do, do has people written papers about this aspect of the novel and can i read with their thoughts on it because i don't know but are they just reaching do they have evidence to support their claims about what it means that's like you know like i have to i i feel like i have to like dig deeper on that to understand it because Otherwise, I'm going to be upset that he just did it for no reason, if that's the case. Well, I don't get the idea that he did it for no reason. To me, it's like most of the things that most of the characters do most of the time, they do for like internally inconsistent reasons and behaviors. I mean, the whole... Um, sexual dysfunction thing with Kearney, the fact that there seemed to be something that occurred in his very young life when his cousins arrived that caused him to depart from reality into a bizarre, frustrated, mentally dysfunctional world, which means he could never relate to women in an um, acceptable manner. And he could never have actual penetrative sex at all. He couldn't um, 
and therefore women became some, I mean, I think in that element, the right, the reason there is um, no explanation about the violence towards women, why he kills women is because he already had the mental problem um, beforehand. He's a, just a damaged person. They're all damaged creatures right across. And the, the number of times you look uh, around at the uh, world and go, what the fuck was that person thinking? Why would they behave like that? You know, just in the real world, not in, in the yeah, but narrative world. Okay. okay, I want to get back to the violence, though, now, because here's the problem that I had with the Kearney violence. If he created this for himself, he didn't need to be killed. Like, there's a difference between being forced to kill to survive and run and, like, deciding that you need to do that because whatever. So... So the book is implying that he has a he had a predisposition to want to be murdering people. Like there was some reason that he interpreted this being like, oh, he interpreted what needs to happen as, oh, I guess that means I need to murder people, right? Like that that came from him. If he's that broken, I would expect other signs of that in his life. And granted, there's some sexual dysfunction, but it, that's you know, lots of people have various kinks and sexual dysfunction, like. He's able to hold down a job and a career and be pretty functional outside and yet and 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 by the way, never seems to get caught. I mean, he's like the, the most notorious. He's got to be killed more people than any serial. Like he's he makes Jack the Ripper look like an amateur. He and they're, and they're like not pre, half of them aren't really very really that premeditated. They're just like they're not done well. He never gets caught. And he goes back to his life like normal and he doesn't, there's no, there's no other signs. I would expect there to be like, if someone told me Alex is secretly a serial killer, I'll be like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know Alex super well, but I would expect to see some red flags. Like there would be some other weirdness that I would expect to see this whole, this whole thing where you like, he it's hidden too well i guess is my point it's hidden too well from every other aspect of his life it just it didn't make that didn't make a lot of sense to me g-man says he believes it though uh i guess there's that trope right of the, the guy next door like he's my quiet neighbor and i never you know he was a nice guy and we never knew he murdered his family um all right i'm gonna i'm gonna let a a in the in the in the spirit of science fiction and transhumanism uh here is what chat GPT says behind about the theme behind dysfunctional sex scenes in light. Uh, chat GPT says the dysfunctional sex scenes in light by M. John Harrison are part of a larger theme exploring the character's struggles with identity, intimacy, and connection in a world that is fragmented and uncertain. The novel portrays a postmodern science fiction world where reality is unstable and characters are struggling to find their place within it. The sex scenes highlight the characters' difficulty in connecting with each other on a deep level and their attempts to find meaning and purpose in a world that is consistent, constantly changing. Ultimately, the theme of the novel is one of existential uncertainty and the search for identity and meaning in a world that is chaotic and unpredictable. Eh, I mean, it's a, you know, it's maybe a junior high school essay quality answer, but, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> there you go. That's what AI thinks of uh, <laughs> of this dysfunction. I don't know that I'm any better at giving any insight on this dysfunction. So there we go. I guess well, that comes it's not bad to because I... Sorry. I was going to say, it's not too bad because the problem is, is that like I have literally never found any a, a human answer to this question. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a lot more comfortable with a load of unresolved um, ideas and themes in uh, the fiction. It, that doesn't turn me off at all. Um, I think it adds um, like flavour and um, depth in a way that you're like, what the hell? It's like um, the character of um, Uncle Zip, um, really um, stylized creature who you know you could put down to his tight pants his tubbiness his makeup and his accordion which is his uh, legacy in the end like floating down a, a wormhole being um, ripped apart continually forever while playing the accordion it's like but 
his relationship to um, his children, who it then becomes apparent aren't his children, but are his clones. Um, it's like the underpinning all of this is not, you know, the spaceships are immaterial. They don't matter. Um, most of the um, import damage and whatever is done by family members to family members in search of trying to um, push their understanding on or deal with the weirdness that goes on in their heads. And I like the way it does it. It doesn't need necessarily need to make sense, not in the sense of being absurdist, but it doesn't all need to be um, T's crossed and I's dotted, um, especially as at the end of the day, um, some horse-headed alien just created us from the hell of it. Only a game. <laughs> right. I guess the reason why I think of these things and uh, from a thematic standpoint is that I am a creative writer and I've spent so much, like, there's the, those rules about you cut things that don't matter, like, in the long term and everything. Like, you have to be saying, if you are, as, as he claims he was, pushing for a more literary stance on the on a genre you have to mean something the things you write mean something and you don't have to hold people's hands i agree with that that's not something you're sure you should be doing at all but um it also can't mean nothing like there has to be some way to tease out a meaning from it and maybe someone has an answer and i just I haven't found it yet, or I haven't figured it out for myself yet, but uh, that's like from the standpoint of being a writer and knowing how we have to approach what we put into a novel, we do have to know what it means. Like, I, I like, there's a lot of stuff that in my novels that like, I'm, I'm not telling you this means this thematically, but I know what it means. And like, I don't there's a reason why you choose every little thing like this is why they're eating eggs at the diner and not chocolate cake. This is why the car is blue like there's there's meanings. Yeah, that's Alex. You just hit the nail on the head for like what bothers me about it a little bit. It's like there's this <laughs> he it's like he didn't do. I don't trust that any of this has actually the meanings like there's not it wasn't deliberate. Um, And I think that might just be a stylistic choice because I think in more naturalistic and or postmodern uh, writing and art, uh, it's intentionally meaningless. Like it's intentionally deconstructionist and like, well, I'm going to bend novel writing by saying some random shit and there is no meaning. Like it's not, I'm intentionally doing that. And that I don't appreciate that if that's what's going on. Although I'm not totally certain that's what's going on. So... Yeah, I need to read uh, Nova Swing and Empty Space again. I've not read those uh, as much. And those are the other two books in the trilogy. Um, if you're hoping for um, a satisfactory resolution, then um, maybe don't read them. Um, <laughs> they don't follow on in the same um, uh, vein at all. Nova Swing is batshit crazy um, and incredibly compared to this so everything... was like, what mm -hmm. worse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah oh my god yeah i i, I know Matt, and I... wait go ahead sorry <laughs> i was just gonna say and then uh, empty space um follows anna kearney 20 years in the future um and it has less science and more um, philosophical um, points rather than um, like descriptions than anything else. Very interesting reads, very interesting reads. But if you're, from the sounds of it, the things that you find satisfying, you might not um, with the next uh, two. But I would be interested when you got mm. to the end, do you think this stands together as a trilogy or nope, the guy's bonkers? I'm curious, actually, I'm curious, have you read the Three Body Problem trilogy? Because the reason I'm I'm comparing the two is it's one of those that is also so kind of ridiculously 
bizarre in the presentation of things, at least by the end. Um, not for most of it, but like by the end, that uh, it, it can also be very confusing at times, but uh, it doesn't. I have more confidence in it, I guess. Is <laughs> what to say. I've only read I, the first I have one. read all three of them. Hmm. How would you compare them, and Matt? They are. With um, the three body problem, um, that whole weird um, starting theme of the dehydrating um, people was fairly bizarre. But, yes. you know, it's got a very physical underpinning and it uses um, the very important idea of the three body problem as a intellectual thing to turn it into a narrative drive that means we're going to be invaded by aliens great um i feel and i'd be interested to know what you both think about this that um you can definitely um i mean it's explicit with some of the uh, red guard business but um the narrative doesn't feel western it does feel um very much filtered through um absolutely <sighs> Yeah, you can't, yeah, you can't use Oriental um, these days without. No, no, but it's it's clearly place. Chinese in theme. Like it's 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 mm. it's uh, it feels like. I, I mean, you know, if you ever watch a Chinese epic movie or something, like, you know, spoiler, they die at the end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, that's just how the movies are. It's like, oh yeah, oh that love thing. It's going to be some kind of tragedy. Like that's just you know, like sh she'll die. So don't get too attacked. <laughs> um, it does have that kind of a uh, a theme With and the three body problem. Feel. Though, there's... Yeah, yeah. I the the end result of the three body problem is it's about the dark forest um, ideology. You know that um, it it's very much rooted in um, the physical and biological world and also in hierarchies do not pop your head up above the parapet because the monster is out there and will kill you mm -hmm. um it's yep. quite a simple uh, message but told over an epic scale which you know don't get me wrong i absolutely love the three body problem i thought it was fantastic uh, challenging and interesting um but take it back to your question how do i compare them um there's a lot more woo woo in uh, light and um, the light trilogy. It's a lot more um, borrowing very heavily from magic realism and from um, fantasy um, sort of motifs, if not. Um, and yes, actually assembling them in a kind of postmodernist kind of way. And I mean, postmodern art, not um, postmodern idiot ideologies about that sampling from different um traditions and then putting them all together in a post-modern uh, milieu i think um yeah that that reflection that you have there is is correct um and as long as postmodernism stays in books uh, particularly fiction books i'm perfectly happy with that when it's in schools not so much <laughs> well they are related but yes uh, uh... I mean, there there is something now that you you mentioned the three body problem being like very Asian in theme. Uh, there is something particularly Western in theme about light. Like it does feel maybe that's the noir theme that Alex is talking about. It does feel like if I yeah I I guess I have to think about it more. I'm starting to lean towards Alex's classic classification of this like if this is just a it's a noir novel it's like a almost like a magical realism noir novel <laughs> like well and the three body problem the first one i would say is a sci-fi novel with a sci-fi epic novel with elements of noir on in it because i don't mm -hmm. know if you remember there's the detective who's trying to figure stuff out in china and everything so that that's still yep. it's still there 
Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not, it's not like the, it's, it doesn't affect the prose. It doesn't affect the themes in which it examines. So I, that's why I wouldn't call it an actual noir novel. But yeah, like, uh, I, I don't know. I just don't, I, first of all, I don't think that Harrison has enough hard science in this book to consider it sci-fi in the slightest. Uh, just, I, he's not, because there's, there's a lot of, rationality based thinking going on in most sci-fi novels wherein if this one variable is different how does that change everything right that's right it's so that's it's very very rational versus and and like and it's about usually chaos theory like the idea that you change one element and everything could change that's it's that's huge that's not what's going on here this is like 10,000 elements <laughs> are yeah. very, and it's not really focused down. Like you, you could say that maybe, maybe the whole Kefahuchi track is the X element, but uh, with, I would say with the Shander and everything that the, the Kefahuchi track is more like a phenomenon that's going on that people don't understand. And right. the Shander, who is this weird alien creature, is more like a deity fi figure. So, like, to me, I'm sort of like, that's what brings it totally out of sci-fi. Like, it's, and and also people act so irrationally. There's, there's not, like, even though a lot of sci-fi deals with how people react irrationally to rational elements, there is no, there's almost none of that. There's a point where, like, Kearney is arguing with his boss and then he goes outside and he sees the shadow and his immediate reaction is to run back upstairs and beat the shit out of his boss. And I'm like, uh, that's not a rational reaction to <laughs> even seeing something crazy. That's not, <laughs> like, I don't care what crazy thing you just saw. Like, he is practically a schizophrenic. We're, yeah. Kearney is more schizophrenic than he is rational. And then it's really hard for me to like throw into anything other than thriller, honestly. Uh, so because he has all this magical thinking and uh, I just, I don't know. I, I find it really weird. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the novel at all. Like not even a little bit. Well, I mean the Kefahuchi track, if we, let's, I, I, I think I'm. I feel better about the book if we just throw out the science fiction classification and just be like, "All right, that's not what it is. Uh, it's just weird. It's like fantasy. Okay, fine, or noir, thriller, fantasy, in a blender." Um, but I mean, the Kefahuchi track. If it, if it is a, let's just take this at face value for a moment, which it's hard to do, but it's a singularity without an event horizon. By definition, that means it affects everything. Like it's affecting everything. So that's the god in the story in some weird sense. There's this unknowable, there, you know, an impenetrable, unknowable thing that actually affects everything. And um, and we don't really even understand how it affects everything. I feel like this book, if he wanted to be L. Ron Hubbard, he could turn this into a religion. Don't knock it, Harrison. Yeah, You're not too not old. A, a, a bad summation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he just—he just looked like a, a bit of a um, old guru. You know, just there's still some of. There. Not all of that. Hollywood has gone. Of yeah. See, not all of Hollywood is Scientologists. There's still there's room for another one. Um. You know, just a, I'm just throwing that's just a business idea for him. Uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm happy with um with it being stripped of its uh, sci-fi uh, moniker. It, it, it's not something I hold onto like as necessarily uh, anything to do with its enjoyment or whatever. Um, and I think there is, I mean, the Deus Ex Machina at the end of it is the uh, last surviving example um, of the alien species who is the Shrand of the Mathematics and uh, Madame Shen. And they're like, yeah, we threw everything that we had at it and found nothing. 
So we built you from nothing because we think you can un not understand it, but experience it. So, I mean, in that sense, it's rather than having um, the explanatory um, and narrative drives a lot of sci-fi does and uh, the messianic and um, kind of like um, legend of fantasy, um, or even even uh, following it all the way through as noir, it's it, it's pulling at um, certain threads that just says, at the end of the day, the world is batshit crazy. People behave in batshit crazy ways. As much as we look at it, we can't understand it. Can somebody help, please? Here, let's invent some people to do it. Like yeah. uh, more, more of a kind of uh, existential um, crisis happening as a story rather than um, any answers being delivered. Hence why, you know, the characters are randomly masturbating in front of their dead brothers or um, unable to form um, sexually or if they see sex happening, need to flush you straight out the airlock. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I guess Ed Chinese could have said just 42 and that could have been the end of the book. Um but I know I kept thinking of like as we're talking about like the fact that they built humanity essentially to find an answer. I'm like, oh you mean you mean like hitchhikers died? You mean like hitchhikers died? Which is a much which is absurdist as that book is, makes a hell of a lot more sense to me. It is a lot more direct in its yeah. meaning. <laughs> that one's intentionally absurdist, though. although maybe this is too. I guess um I don't uh I don't share the author's sense of life. So if 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 this book accurately reflects the author's sense of life, I do not share it. it. And and you just articulated what that sense of life is pretty well, Matt, which is like this. The world is crazy, you can't know anything. Who the hell like it it's like this chaotic malevolent universe where things, you know, understanding is not possible. And so let's write a book about that and um I have the opposite view of uh, the universe. So um, that's why this, that's why this part of that, that, that part of this book falls flat for me, but it's interesting. Like that. I, I appreciate a creative universe. Like, so it's interesting. I'm like, okay, what kind of creature is this going to be? And like, you know, uh, what are the things that he's going to think of? And like, he he's creative. So there's a lot of interesting um, concrete in the book as a result of of his creativity. And like, you know, I didn't expect Saria Moore to turn into a fairy or whatever the hell she like, just weird stuff, right? Um, so there's there's a lot of creativity there, but I think I think the disconnect for me personally is or or the thing that that fails to really grab me is this. I don't feel that way about the world, right? I don't feel like it's this. I'm not worried that I'm going to run into someone masturbating in front of their dead brother or that like thing. Like I don't feel that the world is that crazy and unknowable. And, and uh, I'm not that, I'm not that depressed about humanity to view the world as this kind of chaotic thing. And I don't, I, I think, I think a lot of people exploit unknown aspects of science and probably always have well before quantum theory to use it to justify a kind of uh, see, I told you humans don't know anything and we're incompetent. And I think you could probably do that, you know, all the way the <laughs> back through the history of man, no matter what the science, but the modern version of that is see quantum mechanics is scary and we don't really understand it. And so therefore all chaos, right. And, and we don't know anything when in fact, you know, Mostly, if you're to look at our lives compared to centuries ago, uh, we have the world pretty well figured out in many ways. Not completely, because we're non-omniscient, but so I I don't have that kind of, I don't have that angst. And this book feels like the author has just this underlying angst about existence, this like, this, this, uh <sighs> sense of um fear and discord in the universe and and the, like 
uh, we have to kind of suffer as humans and that's kind of our lot and things are going to happen and we're going to suffer and we're not really in control and we're these small specks in some greater thing. And that, that just doesn't resonate with me. So what I like about it is like the creativity and all the kind of cool stuff going on. And like, I imagine the universe and it's kind of neat. And I did for some reason, like the characters, even if they're evil, like I cared about them in some way. So that, that was good. Uh, but I think, I think the issue for me is that's where it kind of, fundamentally that's where i have a disconnect with the book i think i'm speaking this is all like i'm I'm saying all this extemporaneously i haven't thought of this beforehand so maybe i'm missing something about my relationship with the book but i think that's what it is i i take what you're um saying about the worldview and it's not a worldview that i um, share either um but it is a worldview that is incredibly common in our modern world and it does influence um a lot of the behavior that we see going on right now i mean you know there are lots of people out there who are trying to make our world a very scary chaotic and meaningless place um but for me this is just a work of fiction it is a nice place to visit safe in the knowledge that um however weird the real world is it's not going to be quite like this um, but one of the things that I would just push back a little bit is 200 years ago, we were still quite smug and self-satisfied by how much more we knew than people 200 years previously. Um, and we are, although a lot of physics um, has, by definition, bec- because you can make predictions and see what happens afterwards, you know, it's like, OK, that works. We can't work out this dark matter element. We can't work out. There are certain crunch points that we don't know yet. Um, But it leads most people to think, yeah, we're kind of like 80 to 90 percent there. But there is a sense that I get from this book um, that I would transpose into the real world that that might just be the hubris of, yeah, maybe everybody's different form of physics works or maybe, you know, that missing 1% or 5% when it um, enters the realm of human knowledge means a hell of a lot more than the 1% or 5% of, um, you know, equations that it would then represent. So in terms of posing that thematically as a a question, Uh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, but I'm going to, I think there's a false dichotomy happening there. Uh, It's one thing to say, uh, like, it's one thing to say, well, we've learned a lot and we do, the world is noble and we can know things. And of course we're, we don't know everything and we never will know everything, but like it, it is, a, it is something we can make sense of. There's a difference between having that attitude, which is what I was trying to articulate and having hubris and saying, well, see how much we know. Like, no, we don't know much at all. We know a lot more than we did. And actually the people 200 years ago that said they knew a lot more than previous they were right as well. They they did know a lot much a lot more, but uh, that doesn't necessarily need to translate into hubris. Like uh, we're probably not even ten percent of the way there, not ninety percent. Like uh, there's probably a whole a whole bunch of stuff we don't know, um, and I'm o- I'm okay with that. But um, I think there's an attitude that seeks to exploit that in order to tear down human achievement, right? Because what, what I think the message that I would give to humans is, yeah, we okay, there's a whole bunch we don't know, but we look at what we've all dis- what we've discovered. That means the world is knowable. Let's keep moving forward and let's get that next half a percent of knowledge. And let's like every tiny little bit that we get really increases our our lifespan and our happiness and our our well being. And like every little every little thing we make is is great for all of us. Every little advancement we make is good for all of us. And so. Let's do that. And it's it's an it's a message of inspiration. Whereas I think a lot of people um do the flip side and they say, Well, the glass is half empty. Look at all the stuff we don't know. Therefore, it's it we stop patting yourselves on the back because you can, you know, cure diphtheria now, you you arrogant, stupid humans. It's like, well, I you know, we're not claiming we're God, we're just saying curing diphtheria is a good thing. And like that's like like that, that is a good thing. Stop taking away human achievements by pointing out that we don't understand quantum physics. Like, I, so what? So we don't understand quantum physics. Like, big deal. There's lots, of, after we do understand quantum physics, I guarantee there will be a whole bunch of other stuff we don't understand. We might open up 
that might open up a whole universe of stuff that's like an order of magnitude of more things that we don't understand, right? So I, I, I guess I guess there's this there's a sense of many people, and I'm not necessarily accusing John Harrison of this. Uh, I, th there's just there's a sense though of a lot of people where they they want to take the fact that humans are not omniscient and use it to tear human progress down and to destroy our epistemology and be like, well, see, we can't know anything. So maybe Deepak Chopra is right. It's like, no, he's not right. That's not how quantum mechanics works. And like, <laughs> stop doing that. Stop tearing humans down. It's, it's a false dichotomy to say you either tear us down or we're arrogant and have too much hubris. So it's like, there's a happy medium. Hey guys, you know, we've made incremental improvements and each one is good. Let's keep doing that. Like, and that's kind of where I am. And I, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that's where he is in the book. It almost feels like he's like, actually you stupid, you know, arrogant humans. Your physics is all useless. And really there's just all this, like, think about, think about the fact that how, how impotent you are and, and incompetent you are. Right. Um, and how meaningless you are. And that's not, that theme is not something that <laughs> resonates with me at all. Yeah, I feel like he has a very bleak, misanthropic view of humanity, which is a core idea of noir, by the way. But like, and that bothers me because I don't, uh, I don't agree with it. Even if there are problems, even if like, our knowledge isn't as far forward as some people with hubris think it is. Um, I don't see this as a problem. Like I like like more like Carter. I have a more optimistic perspective and more inspired perspective on what we do know already. And I am totally fine with the idea that not all the answers will be there by the time I die. That's not important to me. And I don't see these kinds of things as a reason to, to let go of any traditional values or, you know, perspectives on humanity. Like, a lot of people seem to take this whole idea that, like, oh, we don't know anything, we or we don't, we, we know so little that, and, and everything we know could be wrong because we've constantly had to rewrite what we thought we knew. Uh, so that means that nothing matters and, and and i hate that idea that nothing matters like i that kind of it's not just misanthropic it's also this idea that like because you are so small and you are so small and i'm totally fine with that as an as a concept you're small you know, like humanity and life is small compared to the entire universe that's not a big deal we shouldn't be freaking out about it though because to me, even if determinism is real, which I can, I argue that it is from a philosophical standpoint, you're a human being. So everything you experience has to be from that narrow perspective. So determinism matters not one jot in your everyday life, and you shouldn't focus on it. And the same is true with the idea that you are small. You are small, but you have an effect on the things around you. And that has an impact. Like you don't get to give up responsibility for the small amount of impact you have just because it is small. That is that is definitely a very selfish rationalization to me. And the same is true with the idea of giving up on all of science. Uh, you know, just because we have a small impact of knowledge that we know that doesn't like we've saved people's lives we've improved people's lives with that small little bit so we can't just give up on it and we can't give up on expanding it and every time we find something new we have more questions everything just keeps giving us more questions and that's not bad i don't know why people think that's bad in fact that's awesome it's more like uh goethe's faust Faust makes the deal with the, you know, he, with the devil that as soon as he's done striving for more knowledge, he goes to hell, but he dies still striving for more knowledge. Like hell is just another frontier to him at the end. It's like, it's, it's, do you see how that's a positive message that 
that there's still always more. That's good. That means purpose is ever fulfilling and ever ongoing. And like to me, all of this is super positive. And I don't understand people who are like, oh, we never reach an end. So that means that that it, it's meaningless and it's horrible and we can just do whatever the hell we want. Everybody just get your dopamine fix. Like I just I find that a very negative perspective. And I do and I and I'm not 100 percent on if Harrison is showing us people who are like this to to show us that it's bad or to be to support the idea. Like I am not clear on that at all. Maybe I'd be more clear with more readings from him, more text, but uh, it could go that way. And I and I'm not okay with that because I from a from the perspective, like I'm so strongly I, against that. <laughs> I, I'm, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna Yeah, I hear you. Um but I didn't ahead, take that from it. I don't I was, I was just going to say, I don't take that. F um, I, I agree with bo what both of you are saying about the uh, nihilistic view. It's, it's just, you know, Carter, you've got kids and um, me too. It's like they come along. It's like nihilism. That, that has no space in my, it cannot have a in my world. I cannot view the world as bleak and desperate and um, pointless, even though I see it all around. And even though I'm still attracted to that as, um, a, a fiction device and um in the um stories i like to consume there's a lot of um hopelessness and apocalyptic um shenanigans um but just bringing it back to um light at the end the in the deus ex machina uh or ex machina moment where um in comes the shranda to say and and this is as uh kearney dies it's like but look at it just look at it. it it is all out there it's there's always something new and um the mathematics madden shen does the same thing with uh, ed chinese like yeah we're gonna break all your bones we're gonna uh, stick holes in you and put you in a little box that you'll never come out of but you get to go and have fun with a spaceship in the weirdness so i did find that kind of positivity that was in there and it really did feel like it was um hidden behind the subject and structure of the whole novel all the way through just for a, a quick peek at the end um and that i found kind of satisfying in the sense that it, it didn't there was no kind of like this is the right way to do things this is the wrong way it's just like there's a whole lot of uh, weird shit taking place and at the end of the day you can be certain that you're evolved from um random chance but it could also be the case that you were invented by um, an alien creature that couldn't do what you do yourselves, you know, which is is not know everything, not be all powerful, but have a sense of wonder and a desire to um, explore. So, yeah, I mean, I, I take the um, criticisms um, and they are um, valid and I can see why that they uh, would be off putting um, to um, you know certain viewpoints um, but my counterpoint would be no I, I saw all of that and it's not a place I want to be but I still enjoyed it at the end yeah I want to I actually there's a there's a caveat I want to make because um, obviously I agree with everything that I I said about that I'm not trying to contradict myself and, and Alex said something very similar that said I do sometimes like noir like sometimes I want to read something that's just a malevolent universe <laughs> like that's absolutely uh i i don't um just because my default view of the world is optimistic doesn't mean i want every story i read to have a happy ending and like uh sure like i so i can appreciate that um <clears throat> but i think I think for me, uh, it's it might be more difficult to appreciate if the if the nihilism is stylistic rather than outcomes based. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, if if the nihilism is like woven into the style, uh, that's a little bit um, 
that's not as that's not I don't get a there's something I must get out of reading like noir, for example, like even though I I don't have a malevolent universe view, view, I get something out of reading something that's, you know, dark and whatever. Like I, I I like that kind of art often, actually. Um, It probably taps into like, you know, I think I've said this before, but like I, I think a lot of people struggle sometimes with like occasional misanthropy or whatever. Like the world's, you know, going on all the stuff's going on around you and you have days when you're just in a bad mood and you're like, God, you just just F you all, right? <laughs> like you've got like days where like thing, you know, you're just in a bad mood and like and I get that. And um and maybe that's what those kind of novels tap into, uh like a a darker dark maybe that's what dark art taps into, right? When you're when you're doing that. Maybe that's why it's appreciated. Uh I think there's something uh you know, you compared, you, you compared, you, you talked about postmodern art for a moment, Matt, you said, well, like, this postmodern, but I mean, in the artistic way, I, when I look at, uh, just big visual art, I can appreciate very dark, uh, visual art. If it's still structured in a, I don't want to say romantic realism kind of way, but like in a, and the, the kind of art that I do like that is positive, that's um, if it's if it's like I, I can't appreciate, for example, Jackson Pollock uh, because Jackson Pollock's art isn't dark. It's not like there's a theme that's negative. It's like it's deconstructive of art generally. Like there is no any theme you ascribe to a Pollock painting is just your own. It's whatever you want. Right. You, you defend anything. Right. So um it's a deconstructive uh, way to paint. Whereas you could take something like Salvador Dali. Let's, let's, everyone's familiar with Dali, right? Um, it's very clear what he's painting. And you could take it to be, sometimes you could take it to be quite um, malevolent. Like it's this universe where like, ah, things are not right and something's wrong or like grotesque or melting clocks or whatever it is. Um, and, but it, it's kind of, clear and you could kind of view that as dark in some sense i wish i had a better example of some kind of dark art but i, I don't can't think of one right now right but there's a difference between that and something like jackson pollock which is like i'm you know dolly's not trying to undermine art as such he's just like hey if you're in a mood where you think every, you're, you're feeling everything is surreal here's a very clear representation of when the world feels like it's <laughs> surreal right jackson pollock is like you can't know art Right. And there's a there's a difference between those two things. And I think this novel. I actually am not sure which side of the line this novel is intending to be on. Right. I'm like, is he trying to Jackson Pollock literature a little bit or is he just like. Hey, this is surreal and weird, and I'm I'm all it's all here for a reason, and it all makes sense. And there's like themes here. It's just it's a dark theme, and it, it's just it's but it's it seems bizarre at first reading, and you have to read it a few more times to appreciate it or something. I can't tell exactly which side of that he's on, and if and I suspect there's a little bit of the Jackson Pollock stuff going on in here in his like I'm just doing this to be. I'm just doing it for the sake of doing it to fuck with the genre. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And I think he probably uh, comes down more on the latter rather than the former. Um, because I, I'm just thinking about um, empty, empty space. The, the final thing he's, he tries to, um, I'm not going to give you any spoilers here, but he tries to draw some elements together, but it's still, it's deeply weird, but he's, he's, it's um, the same motifs over and over again that he keeps using um, with this one. It, it's, um, it's almost zero sci-fi in it. It's just strange and um, much more of the dreamlike imagery. And um, so rather than just trying to fuck with you for the sake of, being i think it's just how he's trying to present things because i mean pollock is a great example of uh, postmodern art because you just look at it and like why the fuck do you bother you know it's it's rubbish whereas uh bringing something a little bit more thematically closer to light would be something like um the fifth element 
you know the movie the fifth element super yeah which i enjoy by the way um, it's i do like it you just, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. more so, so sci-fi yeah <laughs> right yeah. yeah it's great yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, but it's postmodern as well, and it's it doesn't have any duff ideology, and it's not just trying to fuck with the um, viewers' perspectives just for the hell of it. It's like, no, no, we just want to take these ideas and mash them together. It's like, you know, science fiction comedy as well. That's a real tricky line to go, and so what, I, mean, but I think what's... Luke Besson did pretty well. Luke. What's postmodern about the... What's postmodern though about the uh, presentation of of Fifth Element? Uh, all of the flying cars come from the fifties. Sure, um, but that's not that's not deconstructionist lot, yeah. postmodern. That's not that's not like that's not postmodern in the sense of we're trying to screw with the genre. That's just a stylistic choice. Like it's actually quite story wise, it's quite classic as a story and and like. It's a very classic, straightforward storytelling. It's just the the aesthetics, the aesthetics that it's wrapped in are bizarre, and I'm not even sure I'd call them postmodern. But I'd say the most maybe. postmodern thing about the Fifth Element is the fact that it 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 shifts genres through each act. It doesn't stick to one genre which is, uh, it hmm. specifically does, and that's weird. That's very strange. That is deconstructing um, how we tell a story because there's no there's no other movie that really like shifts genre that hardcore between each act. Um, yeah. So, which is one of the reasons why it's so surprising. It works so well. But I, I think that that speaks to Luc, Luc Besson's ability to like really tell the story. And by the way, it's partially based on an old heavy metal cartoon as well. Um, there's a, if, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's really, it's very short, but a cabbie accidentally picks up a woman who's a damsel in distress. Uh, she, the cab, the man, the woman, they all look a lot like Corbin Dallas and Lilu. So um, there's so it he borrowed from a lot of different things to make this very strange movie, um, but it, like there's even some cyberpunk elements to it as well. Uh, and but like the movie is very weird because not because of all of that blending, which a lot of people have done before, but weird for one that the, it worked, and weird for another that he decided to hardcore change gears every act like that's insane that's an insane move and it in it he did it so well i don't like honestly it's a it's a feat that he he managed that and he tried to do something similar with the 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 um i can't remember what it's called it came out a few years ago but uh uh he was adapting a uh, graphic novel but it, it did something in the Hilarious. city Valer, yes, that one. It did not work. Uh, he did that one was a total failure as a as a writing, as a story. He did not. That one does not succeed. Fifth Element is just is stand out um, from a writing when when you throw that when you throw that many um, curveballs um, into a project, your failure rate is going to be insane. And yeah, I mean, I I've that's a great movie, The Fifth Element. I've watched it several times since um i first saw it and every time i'm like he did so well with this um and yes i i uh, take your point about it and um, being classically structured but still uh, uh, thematically like picking and choosing from different elements but um the the point i was trying to um make for myself there with regards to postmodernism is the whole deconstruction thing um is pretty uninteresting to me but in terms of um selecting um different aspects from uh, contradictory traditions and um removing the necessity for a meta narrative within a work of art particularly something that is you know nice and lowbrow like a sci-fi comedy movie um that's interesting to me if it's done well and if it's not done well it can be like that space nazis one um that was utterly awful um that just you know thankfully just i don't think i know what you're talking about that's, well, oh that's you've got to find it 
place. But yeah, this, I can't recall it off the top of my head. I'm not going to try and think about it now. Yeah, it is. Is it Iron so Sky? So bad. That's the one. No. Yeah. Is that the one? I just yeah. Wikipedia. You know, House of Movies are so bad that they're good. This one's so bad that it's still really, really bad. It's not very good at all. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Whereas so, look, we, there, are, there are other elements. Go on. I was just going to say, you know, we've been, uh, you know, it's, all, it's coming up on two hours, so I want to bring it back to the book and maybe, uh, maybe just go around and do a quick wrap up and let, and let you do a wrap up as well, Matt. Um, I'll just start by saying I'm glad I read it. Uh, I might read the next one. Uh, I actually listened to it on audiobooks. Oh. I do not recommend listening to it on audiobooks. A, it's more confusing, and B, the guy who read the audiobook should never read an audiobook again. Um, he should not be hired. Uh, he's he's a British guy who reads with a British accent most of the time, but then he switches to an American accent, which is so bad as to be funny and like, but also disturbing. So, uh, but. I'm glad I read the book. I maybe I'll reread it or re I don't know if I'll re listen to it, but uh and maybe I'll read the next one, but I'm I'm glad that you introduced me to the book. It's interesting. I it is cur it is I am curious about it. So, um yeah, I don't I don't consider this as like a damn Matt for picking this book. I think it was a, it was it was a good pick. It was certainly interesting and it was a great discussion and there's a lot to think about. So, thank you for that. That's my final comment. Uh you guys go I'll go first so Matt can wrap it up. But I do want to say that I just remembered this because Carter mentioned that there are a couple of elements of the sci-fi, the science that don't make any sense, like just weird, like Kelvin degrees or whatever. And I, I had a moment like that for just the world where he said he got a bacon cheeseburger from Burger King. And I was like, when and where did they have that on their menu? Because I remember even <laughs> in those years that this book came out asking that question. Like, oh, I can't get a I can't get a bacon cheeseburger at Burger King. That's weird. And I, it was just the strangest moment and it stuck out to me. So I think there might be like moments where uh maybe Harrison is not just not willing to do research to confirm elements, which I find I which I get is easy on a writer because like hell if I didn't have to research anything my life would be I would write a hell of a lot more novels honestly but um but I I don't I don't know that I would be willing to give him more shots if if another book I see stuff like that again it's gonna drive me crazy from because it's like it it feels like a lack of respect to the craft that I, I have a lot of respect for the craft of writing. So that really, that really hurts me when I see writers like doing what essentially seems to me like laziness. But from the perspective of, he had a lot to say and there was a lot of interesting things here and maybe it could have been even shorter and it be a lot, a lot more tighter and a lot punchier of a, of a piece. Uh, Honestly, I think that that almost would have been better uh, for for the things he wanted to say. If he if he had been, I know it's a short novel, but even shorter. Like I I feel like he it, it could have uh, really hit his skill level at that point. But that's just my final thought. <laughs> okay, well, thank you guys. Um, for me, this. Um, has been a, a total success because um, all I wanted, I, well, I didn't want everyone to like it. I wanted it to be an interesting discussion. Um, I really, really uh, valued hearing what you guys have uh, to say about it, what you like and what you didn't like. Um, and the fact that I can appreciate what you didn't like, but it doesn't change it for me. It's like, okay, there's something um, that I can take from it, something you um, you are not going to take from it. Um, but I think um, mostly it's like, oh, yeah, there's loads of things I didn't like in this book, but I'm kind of glad I read it. Like, yeah, OK, that's kind of interesting. Um, it might be worth giving Nova Swing um, 
a poke. It is very weird in a very different way, and it doesn't have the same. Th there aren't the opportunities for um, not knowing the Burger King menu um, or um, how to represent um, <laughs> temperature on uh, different scales or mixing the scales. Um, but it still has some of those um, elements to it. Um, anyway, that's that's one in from the wind. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting book. It's been with me for 20 odd years. Um, if it prompted a couple of people to read it and enjoy it, great. Um, and always nice to have an interesting chat. So yeah. thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Well, look, Matt, I uh, I really appreciate you stepping up and uh leading this discussion and picking the book and um you know i aside from being lazy and not wanting to be the ones to always pick the books uh it actually also helps because um it's not a book that i don't, i mean alex wouldn't have picked it and thought i don't think would you have alex no alex wouldn't have picked it i didn't even know about it um so it's a, it's nice to have uh it's nice to have more variety and have someone come in with a book that like you know from what I read it's actually quite well known and well respected and he's won a lot of awards and it's it's uh it's a book that's worth knowing um and so I wouldn't have known it if you hadn't picked it and and volunteered to do all the work so uh I appreciate that uh very much um Thank you to those of you in chat and uh, and who've just been watching and maybe not in chat. Uh, I also want to just tell everyone um, the next book club. Let me pull it up uh, so I get the dates correct. Okay, so the next book club is, according to our website, <laughs> March 8th. It is uh, not March 8th. That's a Wednesday. March Oh, that's we Wednesday. It's the one in... after that. Right. What is it? What is it, Alex? It's the 12th? Oh, he he like said that. the 18th, oh, 18th. which is actually Maybe a Saturday. No, he said the 18th. All right. We'll fix it on the website. So actually, I shouldn't be announcing it because who the hell knows when it is. Um, I thought it was. You're right. It was. It's not the 8th. I don't actually know when it is, but it's sometime mid-March. We'll say sometime after the 8th sometimes maybe around the 18th who knows anyway the book is the weirdest people in the world uh which is a non-fiction book but sounds super interesting if you're interested you can uh check out uh i'm almost done with it book club. really oh. interesting <laughs> oh, okay good good and um and i'll fix the website later today when i figure out well it might it take longer if we got to get back from thomas but thomas is running that one so uh we will see you for that book club. Thanks everyone for watching and thank you, uh, Alex and, uh, and Matt. So take care, everyone. We will see you next time. This production was made possible through the generous support of our members to join our community, visit unsafespace.com. Unsafe Space is an online publication for individualists interested in subverting authoritarianism and ushering in the next enlightenment. For biting analysis and nourishing composition, or to sign up for our weekly news brief, The Abstract, visit unsafespace.com. Thanks for joining us today. Warning, this is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized for distribution on Apple devices. The following co-conspirators are hereby uninvited to Klaus Schwab's winter solstice party. Please be advised that CBS News has paused activity on unsafe space while it continues to assess security. Central Bank Digital Currency is a safe and secure way to protect you from Sam Bankman Freed. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job.
thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science, scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice courtesy. Never mind, that last line is misinformation. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.